Yes, he does. <laughs> yes, he does. Thank you. Yeah, that is such a that's such a revelation of God right there. I'm serious, and uh, you know that song comes from uh, from Luke 16 about the shepherd leaving the 99 when he had one lamb that was gone, and that is reckless, really. You leave you leave your whole flock and uh, chase one. But that's why God's love is so amazing and so forth. Bill, you got, you, what? I've been wanting to sit down. <laughs> well, I'm wondering. I just have something I need to share. Okay, well, come on. Uh, it was real firm this morning. I Right. Right, yep. Right, our people, yep. Thank you, brother. Thank you. All right. All right. Praise the Lord. Good word, Bill. Good word. I, that is so right. You know, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. And here's the clicker. And turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven. I knew I would make it through all that. I know. <laughs> Forgive their sin. Heal their land. That's it. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, right, right, yeah. And I hear you saying, Mabel, <laughs> let me come in. You know, you know, I thought that same thing. Mabel? I'm serious. Don't well, let the Lord come get, get you. <laughs> That's right. Mabel, are you up in there? Are you up in there? You better come on out. I'm coming in to get you. Don't make me have to Don't come up in there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the Lord can wreck your party, I'm telling you, man. Now, I'm serious, you know. <laughs> you might not want to have a bunch of Christians around if you're doing something wrong because uh, God's going to make have to come up in there after them, you know, and uh, don't make me come up. <laughs> that is, I thought that same thing. That's been, gosh, years ago I preached something about that. I can't remember. Oh, hallelujah. All right, we're dealing with... Um, Unmasking the enemy, um, and we've dealt with Lucifer last week, and Lucifer is uh, the son of the morning. He's the bright star. His sin was pride, and so we, we learned last week that one of the ways and one of the major ways that Satan attacks us or the devil, he's got, he has 33 names, by the way. The Bible calls him 33 different names. Lots of them are descriptions, but, uh, but there are about five or six that are pretty common names that he gets called quite often. And I've just kind of put forth the theory to us that uh, one of the things about uh, knowing an enemy is knowing his nature. 
Uh, if you know his nature, then you know how he plans to attack, uh, what kind of weapons he's going to use, how, what his schemes might be. And make no mistake about it, the devil has a plan for your life. I'm, I, I, I hope that doesn't disturb you too much, but I'm just telling you, as sure as God has a plan for your life, the devil also has a plan for your life. And it's going to be to destroy everything that looks like God and to keep you from accomplishing your purpose in life. Because God created you for a purpose. God has a call into your life. God's taking you somewhere. Your family and, and, and all those that you love and those around you. I mean, you, you, you're, you're on a destiny. You're on a journey in life that God's put you on. And our enemy fights to make sure that whatever happens, you don't accomplish why God put you here. Because this is a tremendous, uh, God has a tremendous blessing for our lives. You know, Billy mentioned, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven, I'll heal their land, forgive their sin and heal their land. Uh, that's, that's God's plan. That's what God has in mind for us. That's right, that's the good news. And what's going on now, that's what the devil has for you. If you want to just see a, in a little microcosm what he would really love to have in your life, in your family, and everywhere, just look at what's going on now with all of the insurrection and loss of authority and uh, all of those things. It's just, it's just amazing. The devil would love to cause us to riot in the spirit, you know, against God. So we've been looking at, at uh, and we started last week, and we're going to look at about five or six of these. And, and I told you that it was important, one of the reasons why it was important, and I think some of you were shocked last week when I mentioned the survey that was done in 2008, and I'm sure it's way worse than this now. But it, well, the survey that was done in 2008 by the Barna Group that found out that 59% of the people who call themselves Christians don't believe in an actual devil. I mean a real devil, a literal devil. They believe that there's evil and they believe that in the Bible when you see the devil, he represents evil you know, um, and all of that, but they just don't believe he's real, like a real, literal person, alive, de you know, devil in his life. And I'm sure he really appreciates that because if you don't believe he's there, then you're not gonna prepare to fight against him, right? I mean, it really just makes his job tremendously easy if, uh, if we're not even ready to fight because we don't even think he's there. That might explain a lot of what's going on in, in the world. It, and it's always been that way. So we looked at Lucifer last week, found out how to defeat him, how the way that you defeat Satan, whose deal is pride, and who's gonna, who's gonna try to in, uh, encourage you to be full of pride, and for you to think too highly of yourself, and so forth. Uh, the way you overcome him, remember, is through worship. Worship just humiliates our pride. I mean, seriously. When we worship the Lord, it means that we don't think we're as high as him. We honor him. We adore him. He is the highest thing in the universe, and we worship him, and we bow and worship him. Well, that's how you defeat pride in your life, and I shared with you some strategies last week. So Lucifer is the pride aspect of, of, of our enemy. Today, we're going to look at another one that's uh, mentioned quite often. We're going to look at Satan. Satan is mentioned many times in the scripture, and Satan just simply means adversary or opponent. So we know that we have an enemy in life, right? And our, our enemy is an adversary of us. He, 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 he wars against us. He, he's our adversary, and he tries to overcome us in every situation of life. Now, I read some passages last week, and I'm just going to pop them and just read through them. And I, I'm, I'm reading through these because I want you to just kind of get a little glimpse of what the Bible has to say about our enemy, all right? Let's just read. These are just some that I picked out, and uh, I mean, there, there are hundreds more, hundreds more. All right, here's 1 Peter 5. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, your adversary, that word that would be used there for adversary, it would be Satan, Satan, <laughs> because Satan, which means your adversary, the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And I mentioned to you weeks ago about this may thing. When he used the words may there, he's, he's asking permission. If, he, if it was, uh, am, is, it, is it possible for me to do it? 
it would say seeking whom he can devour. That means he has the ability to devour someone. When he says, I'm walking around trying to find somebody who will give me permission to let me devour their life. That's what that verse is really talking about, that, they're, that he's just roaming around looking for somebody that is so casual about God or so unskilled in the things of God, doesn't know the word of God, uh, so naive about the devil that they don't even really think he's there, and he'll get permission to devour their life. Notice verse nine, is nine on there? Yeah, yeah. resist him, <laughs> resist him. How do you do it? Steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. In other words, God's given us instructions. Don't let him, don't let him get permission to destroy your life. Resist him, just like our other brothers do around the world. Uh, here's another one, Ephesians 6, just a uh, few verses here. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That word wiles, just as an information deal, it comes from the Greek word methodia, from which I know you can say the word method comes from that. What is that verse saying? It says the devil has methods. The devil's not haphazard just slinging things at you. He has a method. He has a plan to come against your life so that when the wiles of the devil are displayed against you, put on the whole armor of God. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. And so the Apostle Paul is taking a Roman soldier and, and presenting him before you and saying, look at all the armor that this soldier has and, and think about your enemy, the devil, attacking you and you need to put on all of this armor that he has on physically. You need to put it spiritually on your life. I mean, could, it, could, it really, could God really be any clearer than that <laughs> about the enemy and about the fact that we have to fight the enemy and the fact that we need the armor of God and that it's not flesh and blood we fight against, it's principalities and wickedness in high places? I don't think God could be any clearer than that. Look at Luke 10. And Luke 10, uh, the 70 that he sent out to, uh, to, to go and witness in the world are coming back. Then the 70 returned with joy saying... Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means harm you. I mean, he calls Satan by name here. I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. And I'm giving you authority, he says, over all of the power of the enemy and, 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 and nothing is going to hurt you in any way. And if you use that authority, he said, if you use the authority that God gives you, you can overcome the enemy. If you don't use the authority God gives you, you're going to get your ears boxed off. You know, you're going you're to you're, you're get beat up pretty bad. And God said, look, you know, don't, the verse right after this said, God, God said, look, don't get all excited about the fact that the demons are subject to you. Get excited about the fact that your that your name's been written in heaven. And 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 so and so I want to show you one Old Testament passage, and I'm gonna just put this one in, and I'm not gonna get bogged down in what it really means, because you'll see it's kind of an unusual thing. So I just want you to see what it says about, about Satan. All right. This is from Zechariah chapter three, first couple of verses. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord. You see the A is capitalized? Yeah. That's talking about Jesus. Jesus is the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament when you see capital A. Not, this is not Gabriel, this is not Michael. It's the angel, it's Jesus. And he's standing, Joshua's standing before him and Satan standing at his right hand. What's Satan's job? To oppose him. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan, and the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? That has some real specific stuff, but, but what I want you to see is that the Lord's standing there, and who's standing at his right hand trying to oppose him? Satan, the adversary, the, the, the opposer in life. 
So in this message, we're going to be looking at Satan, and I want to just, I, I, I want to look at him by asking three questions, all right? Here's the first question. Why would Satan pick on us? Why would the devil, why, why would Satan uh, come against us? Why would Satan want to want to uh, harm our life? Well, here's the answer. Because Satan hates the truth. And Satan is the enemy of the truth. And I'm just going to remind you now, who do we represent? We represent the Lord Jesus Christ, right? And what does the Bible tell us about the Lord Jesus Christ? As a matter of fact, Jesus himself said it in John chapter 14, verse, uh, either, it's either six or seven, when he said, uh, and you know the way. And Thomas says, Lord, we, I don't, we don't know the way, and how can we know the way? And what did Jesus say? He said, I am the way. I am the truth, and I am the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. And so because Satan opposes the truth and hates the truth and is the adversary of the truth, then anybody that represents the truth is going to be his enemy. So if you are not walking according to the word of God, he's not your adversary. He's your master. If you are walking toward, uh, according to the word of God, he becomes, he becomes your enemy. I, I, I say that because so many times people, you know, people said, man, uh, the devil never bothers me. Satan never opposes me. I don't even know what you guys are talking about. I don't have a problem with the devil. Well, there's a reason for that. Uh, if you're walking the same direction he is, he's not your adversary. What, what does he need to come against? He's got you. I mean, just leave you alone. Let you go on down the road and be undisturbed. Go to hell when you die. I mean, my goodness, but if you walk according to the word of God, uh, he's gonna be your adversary because he hates the word of God. Jesus said in John 8, 34, most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And what Jesus is talking about there, he's not talking about somebody who just casually sins or occasionally sins or falls into some little sin and then quickly repents and gets out of that sin. He's talking about somebody whose lifestyle walks in sin and, and they live in deception and they live in sin and, and, uh, and, and they've chosen that kind of lifestyle. And Jesus said, all right, if you've chosen a lifestyle of sin to live that way, to not come out, to not repent, to just continue to walk in sin, then you're the slave of sin and Satan's not your adversary. He's your master. When you, come to, when you come to the Lord and you give your life to the Lord, then Satan becomes your adversary. Let me show you this in Acts 26. This is the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul defends himself about three times. He shares his testimony about three times in order to let people know what happened to him on the road to Damascus. Now, just to give you a little brief uh, lead into this, the Apostle Paul is going down the road from, uh, to Damascus, a city, in order to kill Christians. That's his purpose. He's got papers from the Pharisees and the Jewish religion that any time he finds a Christian anywhere, he can kill them. And he does that. And he said, I was going down the road like a fire-breathing dragon, is what he said. He said, I was breathing out threatenings. And he was ready to get them. And he got to a little wide spot in the road called Tekoa, and something amazing happened. All of a sudden, a brilliant light hit him, knocked him off the back of his donkey, and knocked him down on the ground. He was blind. He couldn't see a thing. And all he could just do is look around and say, who, who are you, Lord? <laughs> what happened to me? Here's his testimony. Uh, Acts 26, verse 15. So I said, who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. But rise and stand up on your feet, for I've, I, I've appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. So he, the, the Lord is calling him now. The Lord said, Paul said, God has a ministry for me. God has a mission. I'm calling you to do something, Paul. And he says, verse 17, 
I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you. So my mission for you, Paul, you're gonna go to the Jewish people, you're gonna go to the Gentile people, and what's your job, verse 18? To open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light. Yeah. Light means the word. Light, mean, light means what God says. Yeah. So he says, all right, your job is to go to the Gentiles and go to the Jews and, 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 you, and you teach them and you preach to them and you, you, you use uh, intellect and wisdom and, you, and, 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 and your job is to turn them from the darkness they live in to the light, to, to the word, and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins. Yeah and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith. So the devil is full of lies and deception and his dominion is the dominion of darkness. And so Jesus says to the apostle Paul, yeah. your job is to turn people from darkness, from Satan's dominion to light which is the, the dominion of God and, and the word of God, and that's what your job is to do. Now, you are under dominion of the person that you take advice from. Whoever you receive instructions in, that's whose dominion you're under. If you're receiving lies and walking in lies and walking in half-truths and deception, then of course, you're in the dominion of Satan. You're in the kingdom of Satan. But if you've come out from that and you've been saved by the blood of the lamb and you're going to heaven when you die, the devil can't do anything about that. But even if you're a Christian and you go into heaven when you die, you can still walk in bondage if you don't obey what God's word has to say. Because when you get saved, listen, and I know you've experienced this. I don't have to really tell any of you this. But when you get saved, when you trust Christ, when you open your heart and say, Lord Jesus, come in, save my soul, I wave the white flag, I surrender. The battle is not over. Exactly, Bill. It, the battle has, has just begun in your life. And Satan has just, has just begun to come against you. I'm telling you, when I first came to the Lord, I was so naive. I'm, I was 16 years old. I was so naive that I didn't even know about that. I didn't know that the devil was going to keep on bothering me. I didn't know that I was going to enter a battle and I was going to have to fight the devil the rest of my life. But I'll tell you one thing, I, as young as I was and as naive as I was when I came to Christ, immediately I began to feel the opposition to me. Opposition for what? To do the right thing. Opposition to, 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 to live for God, <laughs> you know. Uh, opposition to, to repent from, from sin and do and evil in my life. Because once we come to Christ, that's when the battle just begins. Uh, Luke 8, let me read you a couple of verses out of here. Luke 8, uh, verse 31, 33. All right. Then Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, he was talking to some Pharisees and teachers there. And they got offended. Yeah. Because they didn't believe that they were in bondage to anything. And then Jesus looked a couple of verses later. They answered him, highly, highly offended now. We're Abraham's descendants and we've never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus, now, they, they have a lot of argument, but in verse 43... Because Jesus says, if you were children of Abraham, you'd do what Abraham did. But you don't do what Abraham did. Abraham sought the truth. You're not seeking the truth. And that's what's going on. Then down in verse 43, why do you not understand my speech, Jesus said? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil, and the desire. Je hey, Jesus didn't mince words, buddy. <laughs> Jesus never read the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. He said, you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father, you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. 
When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of lie. Man, if the devil would just read the Bible, he would know that his days are numbered. But you know why the devil doesn't read the Bible? Because he can't stand the truth. He can't accept the truth. He can't understand the truth. Didn't that what Jesus is saying? He said, look, in you there is no truth at all. Nobody can even tell you the truth. You can't receive the truth. You can't know the truth. So anytime that whisperer stands on your shoulder and starts talking to you, there's one thing you can know for sure. Whatever he's saying, it is not the truth. Because when he speaks a lie, he speaks from himself because he is a liar and the father of lies. Verse 45, but because I tell you the truth, Jesus said, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin, Jesus said. And if I tell you the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's words, therefore you do not hear because you are not God's. My Lord, Jesus is preaching a message. All of a sudden, the Pharisees start coming at him, opposing him, and he looks at them and he says, you're just like your father, the devil. He opposes truth just like you. He is the opponent because there's no truth in him and he speaks lies. And he speaks out of his own nature. He doesn't even have to borrow anything from anybody else. So when you're living for truth, the devil is your adversary because he hates truth. So you think, well, maybe then I shouldn't live for the truth. My life would be much easier. But let me just say to you this, to this. if you're not living for truth, you're going to be living in bondage. And bondage is a terrible way to, to, to live. So the devil tries to destroy us, picks on us, comes against us because he hates the truth. All right, question number two. Question number two is, why can Satan devour some people and not others? I know you've seen this. It seems like some people's lives are just torn up by the devil. Completely. Other people seem to have victory over the devil. Why would that be so? Well, the answer is that some people are protected by the word and others are not. Some people are saved. Now, I'm going to make a distinction here, and all of you Baptists and been reared in the church all your life, let me say the words I'm going to use, and then don't, don't rebel against it to start with, all right? Some people are saved, but they're not safe. Some people know the Lord Jesus Christ. They've been washed by the blood of the Lamb. They're going to heaven when they die. I'm not talking about safe as far as you're not going to get to go to heaven because you sin too much. I don't believe the Bible teaches that. I believe the Bible teaches us when we come to Christ that we're safe as far as going to heaven. So when I say some people are saved, but they're not safe, I'm not talking about going to heaven. I'm talking about what happens on the earth down here. Yeah, that's right. There are some people that are saved because they receive the blood of the Lamb and they believe the Bible, but they are not safe because it's the blood of Jesus Christ that makes us, that saves our soul and washes us clean, but it's faith in God's Word that makes us safe. Satan Satan opposes us because we believe the Word of God and, and we're committed to the Word of God. That's why Satan comes in opposition Well, how do you overcome the devil then? You overcome the devil with the word of God. It's the word of God that we're committed to, that we're devoted to, that we study, that we believe in, that is our weapon against an enemy that would box our ears off down here on earth and make life miserable for us as as long and as hard as he possibly can. Let me give you an example. Here's what Jesus said. This is a really famous parable that Jesus says about this. It's in Matthew 7. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, all right, did I underline that? I should have. Not just whoever hears these sayings. There are a lot of people that hear stuff and they don't do anything. Jesus said, look, I'm going to distinguish between people that just sit there on a pew and listen and go home and live like the devil 
And I'm telling you that if you hear these sayings of mine and you do them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it did not fall for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell and great was its fall. So why in the world would somebody choose the sand rather than the rock? It is easy, isn't it, Lawrence? Number one, I'm gonna just give you three, three things I thought of. Number one is popular. The sand is popular. Now, I know I'm kind of stretching this out a little bit, but you'll understand what I'm saying. Hey, nobody has to tell us how popular sand is, right? We live in a sand environment down here on the coast, right? All right, our whole economy is built on that sand down there, on people loving it, people wanting to come to it, people wanting to be near it. Now, I, uh, as a matter of fact, I'm, I'm, I don't know if everybody knows this, but I put it in your notes so you would. This beach down here, is in Guinness's Book of World Records as the longest man-made beach in the world ever. It is 26 miles long and 200 feet wide and it stretches from Biloxi to Henderson Point. And it is the longest man-made beach in the world. And all of the advertising, our, our economy down here is tourism. I mean, our economy is based on the fact that people want to come down there to the longest beach in the world and get out there and burn themselves up and stupid, you know, get in the water, <laughs> you know, live the good life, so to speak. And, and, so, and so we have advertising and, and pamphlets and all that kind of stuff that go everywhere and, and TV commercials and all that kind of stuff that, to attract people to come in. Now, all of those commercials... On none of those commercials do you ever see those rocks piled up by the bridge embutments. They don't ever go down there and the pipes running out there and they got the rocks all around them and the pipes running out. Why not? That's not popular. <laughs> nope. I've never seen anybody laying on the rocks. Have you? Uh, got the towel out and said, you know, I'm going to go to the beach and just get on there in those big boulder rocks and lay out there and, you know. <laughs> but they show the beautiful white sand all the time. Why? because it's popular and people want to come to the sand. Number two reason you'd want to build on the sand rather than rock is it's comfortable. I kind of just alluded to that actually. I've never seen anybody laying on those rocks. Why not? Well, they're not comfortable, right? The sand is comfortable, it's soft, it's warm, it's flat, beautiful place. Number three, it's conformable. Now by that I just mean when you lie down in the sand and you get up, it looks like you. No matter how unflattering that might be. <laughs> it looks like you. Which, every, you know, everybody wants a custom religion of some kind. A conformable belief system, right? Right? I mean, they want their own Jesus. You see people with a plastic Jesus on their dashboard and, and you know, bobblehead Jesus and they, and, they, and they go and they believe, pray into that, it's gonna really matter. And I, I mean, they just want to develop their own belief system. They wanna believe what they believe and then not believe what they don't wanna believe and they wanna look at the Bible and say, well, that looks pretty good, but I'll take that, but I'm not gonna take all of that. I mean, that's conforming. You, you're trying to conform what what you want into something that will satisfy your soul, that's the sand. Now, the only problem with the sand is that it is unstable. It may be comfortable, it may be conformable, it may be popular, but it's unstable. You can't depend on it in bad times, is what I'm saying. Now, if there weren't gonna be any bad times, then you could build anywhere you want. I mean, who would care if you built on the sand? If there's not gonna be any bad times, that's your business. But I'm telling you, there are gonna be some bad times. That we all are gonna face some bad times in life. 
There's going to be times when the wind rain just pelts us. There are going to be times that the wind's howling and blowing and all of that kind of stuff. And at those times, the, your, your house that is built on the sand is not going to stand. And every single one of us face some bad times coming in life. I know, has any, have any of you ever had any bad times? Just let me see. Has anybody not had any bad times? I, no, I was going to say, well, come on down here to the altar, brother. We, you got a spirit of lying on you. I'm, we need to get it, pray it off of you. All right, now let's look at the rock. Three truths about the rock. Now, you know that the rock is an analogy, right? The rock stands for something. It stands for the word of God. When you build your house on the word of God, it's the rock. That's the rock. All right, so let me give you three things about the word of God that are important as to why you should build your house on the rock and not on the sand. Number one, the word of the God is the foundation for your life. God has never promised us a life without adversity. He just promised us that if we build our, ha our life on the rock, we'll be victorious. If we build on the foundation of his word, then our life is gonna be victorious in life. All right, so let me just do something a little visually here. Uh, I, I'm just gonna just kind of draw me a little box right here. And let me just stomp on it right here. All right, this is, this is my foundation, all right? This foundation is, 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 a, is a protection for my life because I'm gonna build everything on a foundation, right? I'm gonna build my marriage on a foundation, I'm gonna build my family on a foundation, my career, my finances, my resources, my future. I'm gonna build all of those things on something. And you're, gonna, and you're gonna choose that something based on some kind of information that you are getting. It, it, it may be your family heritage just giving you the, the, the information. It might be somebody told you something. It might be something you read in a book. Uh, it might be something you saw on TV. But you're building your life on some information that you listen to. Now, there is no promise anywhere that you will succeed in life, a career, a family, your finances, there's no th nothing in life that guarantees you that you're going to be successful building on a foundation except for one thing. The only thing in this world that says to you, I promise you that if you will build your life your career, your family, your finances, your future, if you will build it on the rock, things are going to be successful in your life. Jesus said, whoever hears these words of mine and does it is a wise man, is a wise builder that builds his house on the rock. And then and, and he says, if you will do this, I will guarantee you that your life is going to be successful. TV doesn't tell you that. Books, other books don't tell you that. Your mom and daddy certainly didn't tell you. Say, well, you know, I, I did this and, and I, it might work for you. But God's word with boldness says, if you'll build on me, I promise you, you're going to have a great life. I mean, what are some of the things that need to be built on the rock? Well, you know, uh, your marriage, right? All right, I've been a pastor for how many years now? 46 years, something like that? A long time. I don't know why I can't remember that, but long time. And you know what I found? I've done, I've done thousands of weddings. You know what I've, I can tell you about people after doing thousands of weddings? People spend months and months and months planning a wedding. And they spend thousands and thousands of dollars on a wedding. And they don't plan for the marriage that comes after the wedding. Did you know after every wedding comes a marriage? Right? And what we should really spend time on is, all right, what is our, what is our life going to be like? <laughs> As a matter of fact, I was told this by a photographer, and it really kind of shocked me. He was at a wedding I've done in the past year or so, 
And he, he, he's a professional photographer, so he takes pictures of a lot of weddings. And he said, do you know what is amazing? He said, before I get these pictures that I'm making at back to these people that I'm making today, many of these people are going are gonna to be divorced before I even get their wedding pictures back to them. That, that, that's, that's amazing, isn't it? I mean, I don't care if you get married on the Eiffel Tower and you have a thousand doves fly up when you say I do and the Mississippi Children's Choir singing in the background while you're having your wedding. If you don't build your marriage on the Word of God, you will fail. Tanya and I have been married for 43 years. In August, it will be 43 years. And I'm going to tell you, we have been through everything. But the reason that we are still standing today is not because we are smarter than you. It's not because we are better than you. It's not because God loves us more than he loves you. He loves us all the same. And he loves us passionately Every single one of us, even, even you sinners out there, you know, God loves you. The reason that we are still standing today is because the Word of God is the foundation of our marriage. When we have issues, what does the Word say about this? When we have questions, what does God say about this? Should we do this or not? Well, let's ask God. Let's ask God to give us the advice on that. But if, you're, if, if, if your foundation is what you see on TV or what your mom and dad told you about life, God bless your mom and dad, and I'm not saying anything negative about them. I just hope that everything they told you was right. But when you get your information that you base your marriage on from God, I mean, I'm just saying that if your marriage is not based on the Word of God, it's not going to, to succeed. And even if it lasts, listen to me, even if you do happen to muddle your way through it and you hang on out of, out of just sheer stubbornness, the devil is going to do a lot of trouble and damage in your life and destroy your life even if you do make it through. So I, I'm just saying that build your marriage on the Word of God and it's going to stand the test of time. What else? Well, parenting. Your parenting ought to be based on the rock. Would y'all rather me just pass this by? Okay. Getting a little late. Proverbs 22, 6. Here's verse. Train up your child in the way he should go and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. How many of you have ever heard that verse, right? <laughs> yeah. And most of the time, um, I don't even have time to go into that. But let me just say this. What that, that, that verse right there says that parents, we have the responsibility to train up our children. That's our responsibility. And we should know our children so well we should know their nature, their personality, we should know their abilities. They're, they're the things they like, the things they don't like, the things they're successful at, the things they're not successful at. We should know our children so well that we can point them toward a direction in life that they can live their whole life and when they're old, they can still be living it like that and it'll still be blessing them and they'll still be enjoying in life. Now, I know that people want their children to be popular. And I know that, that but look, the Bible, but the Bible doesn't promise that your children are going to be popular, right? It doesn't say anywhere, uh, your children, you, you're God, and if you'll pray, God will make your children popular. No, it doesn't say that. I know we want them to be popular, and I'm not against that. I want my kids to be popular. And we want them to be well-educated, I mean, we want them to graduate from high school. We want them to go to college if that's the direction they need to go or go to training school if that's the direction they need to go or go into an apprenticeship program so they can be trained to do something in life that can make them some money. We know that we want all of our children to, or, to, to, to or learn a career. Yeah. But let me just say to you, if your children do go to college 
or whatever school they go to and be well-educated and well-trained, they can be miserable failures in life. Well-educated and miserable. Do you know that I graduated from college in 1979 and about 65% of the people that I graduated from college with are not working in the field that they got a degree in. Why? Because they were miserable. You can be educated, popular, all of those things and just be miserable in life. What does Psalm 1 tell us about life? If you will live your life according to the word of God, you will be profitable. Doesn't it say this? That he will prosper you in everything. Right? So his promise is, look, if you parents, if you'll, if you'll rear your children according to the word of God, and you don't have to be some uh, overbearing, legalistic uh, uh, person beating your children over the head with a Bible and all of that. Just like Deuteronomy says, teach them when you're riding them in the car. Teach them when you're sitting in the house. Uh, teach them when, they, when, you, when you go, uh, before you pray with them at night. Teach them when they get up in the morning, they come down there with, with, with our bowl of cereal and Bradford. Just take the moments that the Lord gives you every opportunity to teach your children principles and they'll be successful in life. Let me move on to the next one because I'm, I'm taking too long. Money. Everybody wants money, right? I think God wants to prosper you, by the way. I think God does want you to be successful and be prosperous. Here's Proverbs 10, 22. Look, the blessing of the Lord, see it? The blessing of the Lord makes one rich. Now, in case you think that that word rich means happy, healthy, or whatever, no, that's not the word that's used there. The word is asher, and it means to make rich, to make wealthy. So he's talking about being rich here. The blessing of the Lord makes one rich and he adds no sorrow with it. In other words, he, his desire for you, his blessing to you is that you would be rich and not lose your health. That you'd be rich and uh, not lose your reputation. That you'd be rich and, 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 and be able to stay married. It, he, adds no, he adds no sorrow with it. That's, his, that's what he desires for you. Do you know that the richest man that has ever lived on the face of this earth wrote a book? It is Solomon, and he wrote the book of Proverbs. And Solomon could buy Bill Gates and, and, and every other billionaire on this earth 10 times over again. He was filthy rich, and he wrote a book that gives you the secret to wealth, and that book is the book of Proverbs that we just reading from. Tanya and I, when we first got married, we didn't have anything. We lived, we, our first home was a trailer, Bill. Mm -hmm. Mobile home. <laughs> a, a 12 by 70 trailer used, a used trailer. And it, our note, we, pay, uh, we were paying it all on, on a note for five years, I believe, and it was $89 a month was how much our note was. And you know what we wondered? How in the world are we ever going to pay for this? $89 a month. Our, our first home, our first home we were able to buy because of a low-income loan given to first-time home buyers by the government. I think it was called a 309 or something like that. And you had to qualify to get it. You had to be poor. You had to be below a certain level of money or you couldn't get it. You know how long it took us to qualify for that? About 10 minutes. <laughs> they came back out there. We gave them the information. They came back out there. Before we even got up, uh, the man said, yeah, you qualify. You qualify. Yeah. Our first home note, note on our first home because of that subsidy and being poor and all that was $319 a month for our home because of the subsidy of the government. What I'm trying to say to you is that you don't always start out on the top. But if you will honor God, 
He will bless you. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I am 64 years old. I have pastored and, and, and worked all of my life. And even though there have been times where it, it, we, we wondered, you know, how are we going to pay this? Where are we going to get the money for that? Our power bill or our house note or whatever it might be. Somehow, God, somehow, I don't know, it's a miracle. God came through. And I'm convinced that simply it's, it's the power of God to bless those that obey his word. Now, you know, God taught us so many things about managing money in those days. <laughs> I'm serious. And, and, and we faithfully begin to manage our money and, accord, uh, and praying about it and asking God what to do about financial decisions and did not not doing anything until we heard from God. And I, I, I had to quit trying to talk Tanya into it, into hearing from God. You know, you know, all that. And now 43 years later, Man, I look back on it and I say, if it were not for the foundation of God's word under our financial life, I'm sure that we would be broke today. Um, Tanya probably would have done fine, um, actually. But I know I would have been broke. I know, I know I, I would, I'd be in a poor house somewhere. The word of God is our foundation. We're saved because of the blood of Jesus. We're made safe because of his word. Jesus said, man, if you, if you hear the sayings of mine and you do them, you're going to be like a person who builds their house on the rock. And the rain comes and the storms come and the winds blow and everything. That, and your house is going to stand strong because it's built on the foundation of the word. All right, let me give you the rest of this because I don't want to last this over, right? Okay, let me just give it, let me give it to you. All right, the foundation of our life is a defensive weapon, right? We build, it, we build our house on the rock. It's going to stand against all the attacks that come. It's a defensive weapon. In Ephesians chapter 6, and I've read it several times, and, and, and it's on one, of these, on one of these slides, but it's about the whole armor of God. And he goes down and he says, you fight against principalities, wars, put on the helmet of salvation, the, the, the breastplate of righteousness, have your uh, uh, waist girded with the truth, put on your, the, the, the peace of the gospel for your feet, and then take the shield of faith. And then it says, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And he says, then attack the enemy. My point is, this sword right here is your only offensive weapon. That's right, Brian. It is your only offensive weapon. Everything else is defensive. And God said, when, you, when, Satan, when, the, when the adversary comes against you and when the opposition comes against you, you take that sword of the Spirit and you let that sword of the Spirit take care of you. And that's exactly what it is. Look, you don't take care of the sword. The sword takes care of you. And uh, let, me, let me just read uh, Hebrews 4. I love this, this verse, and I'll, I'll get it to you. Uh, let us therefore be diligent to enter into that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disbelief. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Pearson even, even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and of marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight. But all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Yeah, yeah. Now, you know what that says? That says when the word of God comes into a person's life, everything that is in that person's life gets exposed. Okay. Nothing can hide from the word of God. Look, you read other books, the Bible reads you. You cannot hide 
Everything in you will be exposed. Now, you remember what Jesus in Matthew 4, when he went to be tempted of the devil, and after 40 days and 40 nights, he was real hungry, emaciated, worn out, tired, and then the enemy came to him, and the enemy said, hey, I know you're hungry, command these stones be made bread. Then the enemy took him and uh, took him to the, to the temple, said, throw yourself off, because God, God's angels won't even let you uh, stump your toe. And then he said, come on out here, look at all the kingdoms of the world, I'll give them to you if you'll just bow down and worship me. Now remember, Jesus is emaciated, he's tired, he's worn out, he's fatigued, he's everything. And, and Jesus took three quotes from the book of Deuteronomy. From the book of Deuteronomy, three obscure quotes from the book of De Deuteronomy and said, man shall not live by bread alone. Just suck. Uh, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. You serve God only, and Him only shall you serve. The sword of the Spirit tore Satan up. Jesus was worn out, emaciated, fatigued, hurt. And three quotes from Deuteronomy ran the devil out of his life. I'm telling you, a four-year-old with the Word of God is as powerful as any preacher or any theologian, any parent, because the power is not in the person. The power is in the Word. Yeah, yeah. The, the Word of God doesn't need any help. It's its own power. All we have to do is use it. No creature can hide from his sight. When the Bible comes in to your life, the Word of God, it's going to find every demon in hell trying to destroy your life, and it's going to defeat them because it is the sword of the Spirit and the Word of God. And Satan can't, look, Satan cannot defeat you until he can disarm you. If you don't have the Word of God, you don't have any offense in your life. You have a foundation, that's your defense. Keeps you saved, gives you some foundation. Sword of the Spirit is your offense. And then there's one more, one more weapon. And, and if I had a little flashlight, I'd be shining it on you. And I say, the word is the light. And let me just give you, let me, let me just give you Psalm 19, 119, 105. You've heard it. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Psalm 119, verse 110. The wicked have laid a snare for me, yet I have not strayed from your purpose. All right? So the foundation is my defensive weapon, the sword is my offensive weapon, and the light is my preemptive weapon. It lets me see stuff before it happens. It warns me, it keeps me from stepping in snares because we live in a world with an evil devil today and he's laying snares for us. And he has methods for us and trials for us. But the light of the word exposes him. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. You know what that means? What the Jews used to do is put a lamp on their foot. They called it a foot lamp. And as they walked, they would take a step and the little lamp would light up the next step. And you take a step and then it light up the next step and you take a step. I mean, you remember there weren't any street lights. It was, it was darker than seven midnights at, out in the fields and everywhere they were going. And yet God gave them light to be able to go again, to, to be able to, to move into that field because God wanted them to know where to walk and where would be safe to walk. So I'm just telling you, how do you defeat Satan? You use the word of God. There's one other question. I'll just give it to you, but I, I'm not going to answer it. I'm going to let you wonder about it. How do you protect yourselves and your families against Satan? That would be the last question. It's real simple. <laughs> totally commit yourself to the Word of God. <laughs> There's your answer right there. Yeah, total commitment to the Word of God. All right, let's bow our heads for just